chapter 8, verses 18 to 28, and um, we're just jumping around uh, from there to some other places. The theme will be hope, but it'll also be, um, well, it'll be hope, let's, let's put it that. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to that conversation, and on uh, Wednesday, we're going to have our Coffee Plus in the morning, and... I will share that there is chocolates that are being made available for sale on Wednesday morning from 10 until 11.30. So you guys remember when the church used to make chocolates and have them here for sale on a special day? Well, now that special day for a little while is going to come Wednesday morning. We're going to have chocolates available here for sale on Wednesday morning from 10 until 11.30-ish. Um, and uh, so if you remember those chocolates fondly, then make a point of coming down for Coffee Plus, and we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing those uh, here on that, that day. The 12 Baskets Food Bank will be packaging over 100 food hampers as presents. <laughs> So we have decided, um, the pastoral team and I have decided that December, we want to really focus our attention on the food bank. Um, so in the years past, we had partnered up with the school and, and done some things for some families through the school. And last year, I was really encouraged when I went to drop our things off at the school, the school was, was bursting with things for families. And I felt like they were in really good stead. And so this year, we're going to turn our attention to the food bank. We're going to help provide items for, cam for hampers. And the food bank has created, not, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this is our Darlene that has created Yes, this. Darlene has yes. created that. This is a calendar for two weeks. And there's little bags at the back of the sanctuary that you can pick up as you leave. Each bag has on it a calendar. The calendar, I love this, because the calendar begins with a passage of reading. And it invites us to, to focus our attention not just on, on the giving, but also on, on what God has given to us. So each day, there's a little thing that you can do. You can do a reading, and then you can pick an item from the, the suggested items below and put it in the bag. It's pretty easy to follow the instructions here. Every bag has an instruction. I really encourage you to, to take this up, and this will be our ministry focus for December, which means this is our last week to focus on the, the children in Rwanda for our Hope We Miss campaign. Right now we're sitting at, was it nine and, no. nine and a little bit? Nine and a little bit uh, children that we are going to uh, be able to reduce a barrier for this week. I know there will be some some other uh, monies coming in for that as well. So we'll leave that up for next week so we can see what the tally is, but then we're going to turn our attention very quickly to the food bank. On December 11th, at Lawrencetown United Baptist Church, in the afternoon at 2 p.m., you guys are invited to uh, join us there for a, an induction service for their new pastor, Andrew Taylor. Now, Andrew 
was a visiting pastor this summer when I was on vacation. So you guys know Andrew, you've met Andrew. I've gotten to know Andrew in the past few weeks. He is a lovely guy, brilliant guy, fun guy to have conversation with. He's going to be a terrific pastor in Morristown, I have no doubt. His induction service will be on December 11th at 2 p.m. And there will be a reception following the service. Uh, so if, you, if you're available that, that afternoon, uh, join us that day to celebrate what God has done there. Then on um, Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4, our friends in Wilmot are Wilmot. Nope, not anymore. I think they were just doing it for the one Saturday. One Saturday and done, one and done. Okay. And, right. and looking forward to doing it again on New Year's Eve. On New Year's Eve? That's lovely. Right. Okay. So That's more to come. More to come on that. Tonight. Tonight, he says with fear and trepidation. Tonight we are going to have an evening of music and praise. And it's going to happen in this place. And it is being um, prepared for as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> but I look forward to tonight. It's going to be a mixture of, of hymns and carols and praise songs and special music presentations. And it's uh, an hour and a half of, uh, of song tonight. And I just invite you to, to come and, and to praise God during that time. On November 30th at 7 p.m. 7.30. 7.30 p.m. <laughs> there is another music night that's going to take place that there's a bit of excitement around town about and, and people who are uh, in choir or are part of this church as well or someone who's in choir or part of this church. Um, so if you love choral music, if you just love good music, um, make a point of trying to be there at the Hope Trinity Inn. Church on November 30th at 7 p.m. for a night of <laughs> singing again. <laughs> and finally, our last thing something new. This year, Christmas Day falls on Sunday. And we had much discussion about you know what we should do on that Sunday. And we've decided that. Some of us are going to cook a meal, and we're going to invite our friends. Now, I know many of you on Christmas Day have got family that you want to be with, and you have plans, and you have things that you're doing, and you know what? That is awesome. I am so happy that that is what you have. But there are some of us who our family are away, or just not with us anymore where Christmas Day could be a lonely day, or a day where we don't have much to, many people to, to be with. So on that day, we're gonna have a Christmas dinner, and we're gonna invite people who might not have as many people to spend their Christmas with. And we're gonna enjoy a meal together, we're gonna celebrate what God has done, and so I just, um, I would encourage you that um, if that's you, I really want to see you do it. If, if you'd like to lend a hand, or we're still figuring out how this is all going to happen, if you're available that day and you want to lend a hand, awesome. Talk to Charlene or I. We'll, we can always use more volunteers. If you know somebody that, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be somebody that comes to this church. Somebody in our community who would love to have a Christmas dinner with some strangers. <laughs> I'll try not to be weird. I'll try to behave myself. Let tell me about them. Tell them about us. I want to connect. I want to make sure that a proper invitation is given to people so they know that Christmas meal is going to happen here. And we want them to be here and be part of that. So Put that to prayer for, for us uh, in the coming weeks as we try and prepare for this. We do want to have a cutoff um, for planning this so that we can know how many people to prepare for. So we've really got two, two weeks or so 
of getting the word out of the mouthless. So, I'm excited about that and we'll see what God will do in that regard. There is 10 minutes of announcements before we begin our worship service. Fantastic. Connie, would you like to open us up? Yes, I will lower it's my muted. It's muted. It's <laughs> muted. Is that still not low enough? Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Our call to worship is Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, a release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, for they display for the display of their splendor. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together today on this first Sunday of the Advent season. You gave us hope. Let us celebrate it with praise and hearts full of anticipation. Be with us all. In your name we pray. Amen. Please rise and sing, go to the mountain. 
beautiful song. Thank you, Alan. We're going to join our voices and sing a hymn that I will confess. I don't know. But Misty knows it, and she's going to lead it to you for a little bit. So this is Good Christian Men Rejoice. struggles, Lord, those who are healing from surgeries, those who are recovering from sickness, Lord, we ask that you be with them. May you guide us as a church, God, in, in loving them and being with them through these difficult times. And Lord, we lift to you prayers for those children in Rwanda who we partnered with CBN for, God. We ask that you bless all that we give uh, as a church here. But Lord, we especially ask your blessing upon those monies that are given to those children. God, may the gift of education uh, lead them to you. May it lead them to understanding of your love for them and your desire for them to know you, God. May you be Lord of their life. Lord, we lift that prayer for our community and our families as well. May you help us, God, to come together as a church and make you known in this place. Lord God, we celebrate who you are and what we have done. Lord, we do so know, God, that we so often don't live up to these calls as well as we should. So, Lord God, we pray for your forgiveness. We embrace you. We pray for the Holy Spirit to continue to stir in us and continue to guide us. And as we embark on this uh, season of uh, Christmas and all that it brings, 
May each week of Advent, God, be a blessing to us. May you open our eyes to your hope as we, as we seek your word. Lord God, may this time together be a blessing to this fellowship. May we grow nearer to one another and nearer to you this morning. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. I read a sentence this week that stuck with me. It was in a, a devotional that I'm doing that's um, excerpts of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's journals. And it's, it's a remarkable piece of writing. But in that, it said, for the greatest, most profound, tenderest things in the world, we must wait. Greatest, most profound, tenderest things we must wait. Advent reminds us of this. And I'll admit that celebrating Advent year after year does present a little bit of a, a teaching and preaching challenge because it is repetitious. But I don't really struggle with it as much as I did. And I'm pleased to say that, that God is kind of working in me a, a deeper understanding. I think this is happening for a couple of reasons. I've come to realize that celebrating Advent each year is not repeating what we did last year, but it's expanding and growing on the things that we've learned from previous years. Every discussion opens us up to new possibilities, to new realities, new understandings. So it's good that we enjoy these conversations each year. Each time we celebrate Advent, we have the opportunity to build on something that we already have. Also, every time we do this Advent celebration, we open ourselves up to a place where we can grow nearer to God. We deepen our understandings of these things each year. Another thing I'm coming to love about Advent is the way that it draws our attention to this time of waiting that we find ourselves in. You're going to hear me say in the coming weeks, probably more than once, that we live between the promises. We remember and celebrate the birth of Christ, but we do so with our eyes and our hearts cast forward, longing for all the fulfillment of the promises that God has made through the prophets and through Christ. So we're in this tension in Advent of knowing that God is a promise keeper. We know that. We can rest our hearts on that, but we, we are still longing for the fulfillment of yet more promises. So there's tension in Advent, this waiting that we have. Advent reminds us that God keeps his word, but that we wait upon God. So Advent really reminds us of I also read this week that waiting can be hard. One author I read wrote that waiting is an art that our impatient age has forgotten. Waiting is an art that our impatient age has forgotten. As I reflected on those words, I realized that they do carry with them a certain truth. Today, we've become accustomed to things happening in a moment. I, I was thinking about this and I realized that you know, one of the big things that's changed is the way we correspond with one another. We used to be that, and I didn't write many letters because it, it was a challenge to me, but if I wanted to write a letter to a friend, I would hand write that note. And for me, it meant that I hand wrote it a couple of times before it actually said what I wanted it to say and it could actually be read. Right? It's always a challenge for me. So there was that process of writing and Writing. And then once I had it in a way that it could both be read and understood, then that note was put into an envelope, which I probably wrote the address on more than once. I probably used two or three envelopes to go through the process of getting the address right and be legible. 
Then postage was added, you put it in the mailbox or you took it to the post office. And then what did you do? You waited. You waited. Sometimes days, sometimes weeks. Sometimes maybe you didn't get the reply. Maybe you got a phone call instead. Whatever it was, it took time. Now today, I write to people all over, and I do it in a moment. I have a computer that fixes my handwriting. I have a, a tremendous spell check thing that helps me with sentence structure and punctuation. It's still not like having Linda in, in your life. I'm so thankful for Linda and Charlie, my editors. But, you know, I can do it. And I can do it quickly. And I can write to multiple people at the same time with no extra effort. It is so simple. And then often, I will write a note and get a reply in a moment. People have the ability to see when it comes. Today, things are different. We've taken the waiting out of life in many cases. And it used to be that we planned and saved for tomorrow. There was waiting in that. Today, we bought. We've taken the waiting out of some of that. People have worked hard in this world to reduce how long we wait. But this life of quick convenience has had its consequences. The way I've thought about this, just like we, we lose mobility when we don't move, like if you if you don't do something for a while, you lose that ability. You lose muscle when we don't exercise. Just like that, when we aren't challenging ourselves to wait, we lose some of our ability to wait. And I will say that I think that we have lost some ability to wait. If you just stand in a lineup at the grocery store or sit, sit in a lineup of traffic, if the lines aren't moving, it doesn't take very long for someone to reveal how challenged they are when they wait. And I hope that person that reveals that isn't your pastor. <laughs> I'm actually someone who is comfortable with waiting in most cases, but still, it can be a challenge. But the challenge, the the sad truth is waiting has become a lost skill. And in truth, I think Advent is good for us because it reminds us that we wait upon the Lord. In Advent, we get to exercise our waiting muscles once more. And I think we need Advent as our part of our preparation for Christmas. It's not something that's biblical. You won't find Advent in the Bible. You know, laid out this week you do this and this week you do that. As, as Baptists, we love it when we can point to the Bible and say, yep, there it is right there. But Advent, the, the, the ideas that we celebrate in Advent are clearly biblical things. Hope in the Lord, waiting upon the Lord, clearly biblical. We are losing our ability to wait. So, Having this reminder in Advent is good for us. I think that we haven't just lost our ability to wait. I actually think that having lost some of our ability to wait has had a different effect on us. It's actually brought us to this place where we don't wait for anything. And when we don't wait for things, we come to expect things quickly. And expecting things quickly numbs us to the joy of the anticipation of the thing that we are expecting. I think that when we get too much too fast, it has the effect of numbing us to the joy of receiving. This numbing has occurred in our culture. People are a combination of impatient, greedy, and ungrateful. And I, I say that with truthfulness. I think that people are those things, impatient, greedy, and ungrateful. This reality is played out in homes all around, including many of our own. 
we have, as a culture, become accustomed to getting too much, too fast, and it has numbed us. We've been deceived and misled, and we have in turn deceived and misled ourselves and our children. We become numb to how much we consume, and numb to how much we have, and numb to how we go about our days. Christmas has been turned into this time of running around and thinking that we have to buy a bunch of stuff. And because of this, our loved ones have become anticipative of such things. They expect a bunch of stuff. We've done this. We've done this. I've done this. And the sad truth is that this has all been done in the name of Christ. Christmas, right? We've twisted it. We've taken the way of our life. We've rushed to get things and do things and we've forgotten what it is to hope in the Lord and what it is to hope for good things and what it is to expect good things and what it is to have joy in what we have. Our greedy eyes have deceived us. The things we think we long for leave us feeling empty and longing for something else. We simply toss aside what's disappointed us and in the blink of an eye we turn our sights onto the next idol, idol that's captivated our thoughts and our desires. This is our disrespect and our ungratefulness. And this is our impatience. And these things will speak for us in our lives. Christmas is something that we need to pay attention to. Not in the normal way that, that you're used to paying attention to Christmas. I think we have to pay attention to Christmas in a new way. We have to start reframing how we do Christmas. We have to start reclaiming Christmas in our lives, in our homes, or else we run the risk of not understanding what we wait for. Not understanding what it is that we have, and not understanding what it is we anticipate. That's the reality. Now, I've painted a, a pretty dire situation. But we aren't without hope. This is the thing. This is why I love Advent. It turns our attention on this, our attention on the tension of waiting. Waiting shows us that we live in hope. And our hope is well placed because God is a promise keeper. So we turn our attention, we turn our attention back to God. This is just like the Old Testament. <laughs> the Old Testament where God is saying, you know, pay attention to me. This is what we're doing. We're turning our attention to God. Today, I want to read from Jeremiah. Chapter 33. It says, The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and Judah all the good things I will promise them. In those days and in that time, I will write, raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. And in that day, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety, and it, this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16. God is a promise keeper, and he gave these promises, and he assured them that's what he was going to do, and with the birth of Christ, he did what he said he was going to do. Christmas, the celebration of Christmas is celebrating the fulfillment of these promises. We live between these promises, yes. But our celebration of Christ should look like the Lord is our righteousness. And it doesn't. The celebration of Christmas should look like the Lord is our righteousness. And it doesn't. So, let's reframe it. Let's put some hope into it. Let's pull hope into our celebration. We are people whom God has extended this great gift of salvation. We have received a gift that is an eternal gift. It will not tarnish. It will not fade. It will not break. It will never lose its value. It will never be recalled. It will 
never be anything but what it is. It is fully all it can be when we have it, but yet we anticipate it being complete. We have to start living as if that is the truth. In the Old Testament, the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and the fulfillment of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, those things fuel the hopes of the Hebrew people. They look back on those things that God did and they said, you see what God did there? That proves that God keeps his word and we can look forward to all the things that God has told us in the coming Messiah. Those things prove what God is going to do. That's the way it worked in the Old Testament. They placed their hope in God that he would send the promised Messiah one descended from King David's throne. In the ancient Hebrew, they had two words that we've translated to hope in our English Bibles. Yahal, which means to wait for something, and it's much like it sounds, it's just, it's just that waiting. Noah waited for weeks for the waters to recede. You know, he sent the bird out, the bird couldn't land, so he waited. He sent the bird out again, the bird brought back just a little bit of a stick of something, but he knew there was still water, so he waited. He, Yahal, for weeks while he waited patiently for that water to recede. In Psalm 40, David wrote, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. These are just that idea of waiting. But there's another Hebrew word that translates to waiting, and it's more hopeful in its way. Kava. It means to wait, but it has this expectation of something happening. The word kava comes from the word ka, which is a cord or a string or a rope. And if a ka is put under tension, it will eventually break. Kava. That, that something will happen. You put enough tension on it, something will happen. Kava. So there's this expectation that Something is going to happen. So they both waited and they expected. And passages often had one or both of those things being used. They waited on the Lord, but they were fully expected that God would do what he said he would do. And they looked back to their history to fuel that looking forward in anticipation. Hope is about waiting. But it can also be about waiting anxiously. Anxious expectation. Isaiah said, Bind up the testimony and seal the teaching among my disciples. I will Yahweh, wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the host of Jacob. I will hope in him. Kaba is the hope that he has. There's this expectation that something will happen. I will wait, but I expect. God to do something. Passages like this are the best expressions of Old Testament hope that we can pull forward to Advent. It is waiting and expecting. And it's waiting and expecting with something to, to stand on. We, we look back to what God has done in order to fuel our vision forward in anticipation of what God will do. The world is in darkness, yet in God we find light. The ancients lived with longing and anticipation. They placed their hope in God and his promises. They hoped God would restore his chosen people to greatness. They hoped with tense expectation that Yahweh would send the Savior, the Messiah, a priest, a king in the family line of King David. Those faithful ancients lived in hope for God's rescue. They waited with anxious anticipation for what God had done. How does our Christmas reflect our hope? How does it reflect our anticipation? God set forth a 
a plan of rescue. He did what he said he was going to do. He proves he's trustworthy. He proves he's mighty. He proves he loves his creation and humanity. Waiting on God can be hard, but we place our hope in him based on what he has done. Now in the New Testament, the Christians, they carried on this, this idea of hope in the Lord. Christian hope is a little bit different, but same, the same really. They retain the idea of hoping God with expectation and anticipation. It's said that the empty tomb opened up a new door of hope. The Greek word for hope is elpis. It has with it this understanding of expectation. When we look back on the birth of Christ and the stories around it, what we have in the Gospels, the New Testament Bible fuels us with confidence that we can look back and see what God has done and look forward with hopeful anticipation for what God will do. Today we can look to the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and see how those events are all tied up in prophecy and expectation. These things fuel our hope. So our hope for today is similar to that in the past, but it's also different. Because like them, we wait on the Lord, but today we wait with even more understanding, with more revelation, with more knowledge about who God is, how God loves, and the great lengths that God will go to to restore creation and humanity. God has gone to tremendous lengths for us. This should fuel our hope, our longing as we wait confidence in what God has done. In Romans chapter 8, Paul has written thus, all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Creation, Paul says, looks forward with eager hope. Creation. Well, folks, we're part of that. Let's join in creation, looking forward in, in eager anticipation of what God will do, freeing us Today, we live between the promises. We live, live between the fulfillment of God sending Christ to save and the final completion of all that Christ has promised. The complete restoration of, of creation. A new heaven, a new earth, new bodies for us. The fullness of all God has promised. We, we long for that. We wait for that. Creation even hopes for it. But we're not like children who go to the mailbox day after day, waiting for a letter or a card or a gift that never comes. Right? I've seen these stories played out in real life where someone is anticipating that someone will remember them. They wish someone will remember them. Nothing ever comes, and it brings heartache and hurt. This is not like that. This is hope that is rooted in what God has done, fueling our anticipation of what God has yet to do. That is how we wait. Our hope in Christ is a living hope. 
it reaches beyond change and decay. It is what it is, and it will be what God intends it to be. It will be complete. But it won't be complete until it's complete. And that's why we wait. Because God has promised us he will do what he does. So we need to exercise this waiting muscle. We need to be filled with confidence that God's word is trustworthy, but joy that God is a promise keeper. We may be people who haven't got things right all the time. We are. But God loves us and is working in us and we are. We can be better. We're always being challenged to be better. So may our impatience for God become longing for Him. May we be fueled by good gifts, the good gift of salvation. May we pass our days of waiting, not idly, but by seeking justice for folks who aren't receiving justice, feeding folks who need to be fed, providing schooling for children who don't have school. Looking out for the sick, the hungry, the hurt. Being there for people. That's how we pass our time while we wait. That's what God called us to do. That's who God called us to be. So we can fill our lives with this longing, this anticipation, but also with the, the work that he has called us to. And we need to be doing this understanding that if we never come to know the blessedness of waiting, that is, living out our Christian hope well, fully trusting that God is a promise keeper, then we will never truly experience the full blessing and fulfillment that he has for us. And that blessing is in our lives lived to the fullest as well as receiving the final grace. The full blessing is is what God can do in us today as we look forward to tomorrow. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to think about how we do Christmas. And I want to offer encouragement. There is, there is grace and love and God doesn't expect us to... I shouldn't say this. I don't want to speak for God. I don't know how God expects us to do things, but for me, it tends not to be something that happens all at once. I tend to make a step forward and maybe make a step or two back, but usually I'm progressing forward. Let's try and progress forward in how we celebrate Christmas and how we do things. Let's try and make our waiting and our anticipation of what God will be part of our celebration of Christmas, fully knowing what God has done, celebrating what he has proven to us, time and time again through the sending of Christ, through the salvation we have received in him, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the way God has empowered us and pushed us forward, the way God has blessed us by bringing us here together as his church in this time. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's be his church this Christmas. Praising him, making him known in hopeful anticipation of what God has done. Lord, May God bless us today as we rest in Him. Always. I want to invite the praise to not to sing the final song. Sing, oh, come, oh, come, and then you are for you. Um, the words aren't going to be on the screen, but you are going to sing. Um, I'm sure that Christ will let you know well. You're welcome to sing with us.